On May the 6th, 2010, at 1400 hours, 42 minutes and 44 seconds, the US stock markets go into free fall. Dow Jones takes the fastest and most dramatic nosedive in its history, an event that will be remembered as the flash crash. Where, where are you on May 6, 2010? Uh, here working. Um, May 6, 2010, yes, I was, I was here. I spent all day, literally, uh, locked away on holiday looking at the uh, British general election. 10.53, so 90 handles? That's too much. That's way too much. I was on a conference call with a potential investor, one eye on the market, when I on my own profits and losses, uh, and then my ears and mouth doing whatever else they have to do. And the market basically looks like it's going to go to hell that day. It was the first really down day that we had in a while. And I remarked to Dave, let's just stay on top of this, because this could get really ugly. So 40 minutes in, we're having in the middle of a great conversation. And he says, look, I got to go. We'll talk again. This was really interesting, but I have to go now. And I watched the market fall another, what, 2 or 3% from there. It wasn't just minutes later. It was just, it was Armageddon. Here you go. I'm told it's 835. The Dow ticker. Wow. Almost 1,000 points. We call this a capitulation. Uh, I was just uh, opening up my computer, like most everybody, and going, oh, my God. Uh, I'm shouting to my colleagues, because I have a giant TV in my office gawking at the screen. Like when the Dow hit nearly down a thousand points, you're like, really? 87 even dark trading, 86 even dark trading, 85 even dark trading, and I'm like, oh, they're very dead. And people didn't know why it was happening. And there was rumor after rumor after rumor, and it kept on getting worse. I saw that panic, you know, I think then, then I started watching CNN or one of those. Things, so. What we're seeing right now, I mean, it, it, maybe, I, I believe maybe unprecedented. You're not, talk about capitulation. Let's take a look at P&G. They're going to probably halt trading. We can't stop the selling. I don't think I found out about this in real time. So this was probably a half an hour later or, or an hour later. There's, there's nothing that one can do in the middle of the day. Uh, so we, there's no button that we press that says, uh, hey, stop, stop what's going on. So the markets are going to move the way that the markets move. It just didn't fit the facts that there was some big global news story. It looked more like an error or a bad price. That's what it looked more like at first. And then it got magically better. And nobody had seen a recovery that quick either. It was a little bit like seeing someone hit by a car or you see some terrible motorcycle accident, you know, the guy must totally be dead, and then you know, the person gets up and walks away. And about no, the market minutes. didn't work. It broke down. The machines broke down. That's what happened. You know, Proctor was never at 47. That, 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 to me, is the, the, the mystery. I mean, I mean, I think it really, we, we don't understand these things. This is really the earliest form of uh, digital financial instrument. George Dyson is a historian who has just completed a decade of research into the development of one of the first computers. What I'm doing now is carving the data into this stick. This notch represents 100 pounds of gold. These go back to the 12th century. And these smaller, there's a 20 pounds and 10 pounds. Now it breaks into two pieces that are unique. 
This part stays with the exchequer, with the, with the king's treasury. The person who brought the money keeps this part, which is, which is of course called the stock, and that's the origin of the, the word we still use of, of owning stock in something. So if you put money in your bank or something, you're essentially getting a number that is uniquely matched to the money that's in the bank. And if you come back and say, I want uh, my money, you get it. So it's the same principle, it's just, it's just moving uh, a whole lot faster. On the morning of May the 6th, the sun rises in Asia and all is still quiet on the financial markets. But the British elections and the continuing concerns about the Greek financial crisis are causing anxiety. When the American exchanges open, prices are under pressure. At 2.45 p.m., many shares, including those of Apple, Accenture and Procter & Gamble, collapse. So you've got the general picture, leave the big picture, although it's still over a very short time scale, and then you've got the detailed picture of um, the individual trades. See, there's a little bump there. That's almost the, the more natural um, scale, whereas even here at this level, it's something that seems to be quite big. So there are some trades that are kind of normal, and then there's... there's yes, yeah, funny, these, these, these big... They, they, you're right, these, these are really big, aren't they? So the way can you explain this? You can explain it. Paul Wilmot is a mathematician and quant who is privy to the algorithms used by the automated systems driving the financial markets. Uh, the, th the thing that's sort of, sort of easier to explain is in the, the zoomed out scale. And you can see this nice whew, falling off a cliff and then bouncing back up yeah. thing. What's harder is these, the, these spikes, the, the trades the trade happening down here, but every now and then there's something up there, which is... Um, yeah. And the differences are enormous, enormous, differences, seconds. enormous differences. But what's causing it? Um, I don't know what's causing it. This one goes, it starts off at 42 and it goes all the way down to one, <laughs> one cent. Lord above, it's amazing. It's, it is uh, better to fail conventionally than to succeed unconventionally. Wilmot gives classes to traders, hedge fund managers and bankers. For years, he has warned about the dangers of an algorithm-induced collapse of the financial markets. Oh my gosh, I, I turned away and that happened. So who is it selling Accenture at five cents? It has to be a machine, right? Yeah. Essentially, they're just rocketing back and forth between. Yeah. You know, only a machine can do those, right? Any thoughts of... Um, What's going on here? Steve Jobs didn't die. There's no reason for Apple to be falling to zero. Right. And so they start trading. And then, I mean, the, the back up in, what, seven and a half minutes or something, it was incredible. And that what, couldn't have been people not right. reacting that quickly and not in that kind of volume. Well, one key thing is how automated is all of this, all of these, these trades? Uh, can, can you identify that this was caused by some, some black box thing? Or was it somebody? in the old-fashioned way, picking up a phone, etc., and making a trade. I've got in my head a, a scenario where there, there, are no, there are no people at all anymore. There are just there are, there are black boxes, and they're really clever back, black boxes um, designed by famous banks that we won't name, and um, not so clever back, black boxes. And one day, the, the clever black boxes decide to stop trading because they don't like the numbers that are coming in, leaving you with a quite dumb black boxes that'll do basically anything. Accenture should not be um, selling at a couple of cents. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, so if you're just left with a, a bunch of dumb black boxes, they could be doing anything. You know, the Vatican selecting the Pope is maybe a pretty black box kind of a process. They take in inputs about the candidates, they, God knows what they do in there, and then there's some chimney smoke, and boom, it's done, right? There's your output. Rishi Narang manages a fund investing in a global network of high-frequency traders. He is a strong believer in automated financial markets. So it's any process, whether systematic or not, that, um, that has inputs and an output, but where the process of transforming the first into the second is just is unknown or unknowable. So, so a black box is a box, I mean, these modern black boxes are boxes that sit at the, at the stock exchange and has some rules or algorithm, I mean, it's, it's concealed within the box. 
that decides on Wednesday I'm going to buy this stock and on Thursday I'm going to sell it. So we don't know what's in these black boxes, and that's the that's really the interesting thing that you that it's like it's like a potentially a poker game where you don't you can't see the opponent's cards, but you know how much they're bidding. So this is um, this is a big financial service firm here. So no name on the door. Nothing. You would never know what's going on here. As you notice, it's guarded, gated. Um, there's cameras everywhere. They probably know that we're here right now. So in a period of time, they'll they would come out and say, "What are you doing? Stop doing that," type of thing. Uh, and if you rolled up and said, "I'd like to come in," they would not let you in. Jeff Hipsman, once employed by Wall Street investment bank Lehman Brothers, now works as a data center broker for the world's leading financial companies. And obviously, and, and also no signage, so you don't know whose facility this is, you don't know what's going on inside of it. Uh, you know, completely uh, a nondescript building. No windows? No windows. If this building has a problem, if this building is damaged, if this building, if anything happens to this building, they run the risk of not being able to execute trades. So they protect this. This is the heart and the lifeblood of their business. So imagine your home where you have double everything, double power utility feed coming in, two refrigerators, two washing machines, two televisions, and if something were to break, you can go immediately to the second, uh, second device. In the data center world, that's called a tier four facility. And what they need is two of everything because the cost of downtime to these organizations, if they're not able to trade or they lose trading operations for seconds, it could cost them an enormous amount of money. Some of these firms take it to the next level where not only do they have it with a duplicate within a facility, then they have a second facility that's exactly the same. The goal of these facilities is to minimize, if not eliminate, any single point of failure. New Jersey is a very hot market for data centers because of the distance issue to Manhattan. When you're dealing in milliseconds, there can be absolutely no delay. Being that the technology has a limitation in terms of how far away it can be in terms of that latency, it's based on the speed of light between one point and another, that distance becomes your outside ring, your outside distance that you can go, it tends to be in the neighborhood of 30 to 35 fiber miles. So we're constantly tracking the fiber as to where it is and what the main routes are. And we also track where the power is, because another main component of these facilities is they are very heavy power users. They need an enormous amount of electrical capacity in order to operate. We don't want to have any outside event cause an outage in the facility. These may be things like highway access. Can a tractor trailer accident cause an evacuation of the area? We look at flight patterns. We look at floodplains. Uh, we look at nuclear plants. We look at rail lines. We'll look at crime levels. We've looked at lightning strikes. The goal is to eliminate any possibility that one event can cause an outage in the facility. So a typical facility could be anywhere from three to four hundred million dollars. You know, the wealth can be distributed evenly or wealth can be distributed unevenly. And, and wealth can be distributed unevenly among people. And it can likewise be distributed unevenly and evenly between people and machines. I mean, all the money is flowing to the computers. And, and the same with these stock exchange facilities in New Jersey. The, the money is flowing through these points and uh, the machines are surrounding it, just sort of siphoning away that, that wealth. But if you go into the neighboring communities, the people are really very poor. High frequency traders are estimated to generate more than half of the entire equity trade volume in the US. Traders, or rather computers, making money by buying and selling within a matter of milliseconds. If you think about the market and the center of the market being the innermost circle, the specialists or the market makers at the exchange, the exchange members, and then there are these concentric circles as you go further and further out, and the last circle is some mom-and-pop investor 
that's not in a financial center. Uh, they're in the middle of a farming country or something or farmland. So the speed that the highest frequency trader knows something and can act on it before a discretionary trader sitting on his farm and his home PC is now a matter of a second or two. Does that also mean that the high frequency trader has to earn his or her money within these two seconds? Yeah, it does. Yeah, because by then the rest of the world is, is processing the same kind of information. Um, they call it the race to zero uh, because uh, zero is the amount of latency or uh, delay. So if you think of this in a really metaphysical sense, in the actual market, some, an event happens. Someone raises their bid from $100 to $100 and one penny. How fast can you actually receive that information? That's the first question. The second is how fast can you process it? And the third is how fast can you get your, your decision back to the marketplace to act on, right? So this is why speed matters. I'm interested in the origins of the digital universe because it's this world that affects us all now. I mean, we all we live in this digital world, and how, how I'm interested in the beginnings of things. How did it start? So this particular computer that I've spent so much time interested in is not the first computer. But what's important was it was the first randomly accessible electronic memory. That's the the critical thing. The size of this matrix was 32 by 32 by 40 bits, so that's five kilobytes. That's now the memory we use to display an icon on our desktop. And I think in an MP3, it would be half a second of, of MP3. That was, that was the size of this universe they created. Up until then, numbers represented things. You'd say, well, I have 10 oranges or 10 apples, or the temperature is 10 degrees. Now you had numbers that were order codes that could actually execute instructions in the machine. So numbers were allowed to do things. These are the crew of the product, the guys who, and women who really made it work, the, the engineers, machine shop people, the women who did the coding. And their name for it was Maniac, Mathematical and Numerical Integrator and Computer. On the Maniac, they did the calculations that led to the first hydrogen bomb test, which was called, was called Ivy Mike. You can't just build a small hydrogen bomb and see if it works and then build another one. It, it, it has to work the first time and nobody could, uh, I mean, I think they could have done it by hand, but it would have taken 20 years. That's what's I think so profound about this financial thing because suddenly it used to be well this is sort of a, of interest to people you know designing nuclear weapons or studying the spectrum of light coming from stars I mean who, who really cares about what happens at frequencies of a billionth of a second it just it really only concerns physicists now suddenly it you know you it concerns all of us because it's it's gone into this financial world that, that represents all our, you know, all our wealth. I only see 570. Why isn't it updating? All right. All right. We're in bear market. On May the 6th, 2010, at 1400 hours, 42 minutes, 44 seconds, and 75 milliseconds, an e-mini future traded on the Chicago market begins to show erratic price swings. The fluctuations affecting this e-mini, an important indicator of market moods, soon spread to other shares within the US, ultimately leading to the fastest and most dramatic fall of Dow Jones ever. Nearly $862 billion go up in smoke, albeit briefly. There were two things that stood out uh, a lot. One was the speed that the market initially plummeted. Greg Berman, a Wall Street veteran himself, led the investigation into the flash crash from SEC, the US financial market regulator. Uh, so for broad indices to plummet 
uh, multiple percent, three, four, five percent in a matter of a minute or two or five minutes, uh, that in itself is quite extraordinary. The second aspect uh, that was even more extraordinary was uh, the number of stocks that were affected and the depth that some of these fell to. Uh, so when you see large cap stocks fall 60, 70, 80, 90 uh, percent, that was quite dramatic. Uh, at that time, what we didn't understand, and again, we're talking about just two to three hours after the event, is how can stocks trade for a penny? How can stocks trade for one one hundredth of a penny? Who's buying and who's selling down there? So when this E-mini drops, then the SPY drops. Well, the SPY is made up of 500 different stocks, and then all the stocks in there are members of indexes, different indexes, and so they'll reprice. And then all, the whole mess has options on top of it. And for SPY, it's pretty much all the options. So those all have to reprice. So you're trying to reprice all this stuff in 50 to 100 milliseconds, and the system cannot handle that. Evanston, a city just north of Chicago, is home to Eric Scott Hunsader's company. Hunsader is a data analyst whose company collects, purges, and sells financial data. On May the 6th, he received urgent reports from clients complaining about incorrect share price information. The markets could no longer sustain the massive data flow produced by this flash crash. And that's when the delay started a few hundred milliseconds, and then a few seconds, and then five seconds, and then ten seconds. And then some of them went all the way to 36 seconds. So the delay in the data was 36 seconds. Right, but the way that the timestamps occur is it hid the delay, so you couldn't see it. The Dow Jones it was actually should have been here. The real price was here. The delay in the system caused it to appear like it was over here. So when people were seeing the Dow dropping, this uh, was actually really where the market was at that moment in time. What we're seeing right now, I mean, it, it, it maybe I, I believe maybe unprecedented. You're not talk about capitulation. Let's take a look at P and G. All right, this is going to say everything. P and G is now down 25 no, percent. Well, that's true. Okay. That stock is there. You just go but and buy it. That can't you know, be there. To watch people talk about a major business news channel who have seen markets day in and day out. And they didn't know that this market had already turned and was flying higher. Something's not right. You should at least be able to know that you're behind. I mean, it's one thing to be behind, it's another thing to have no idea you're behind. Long before the SEC report came out, Eric Hunsader had published his first findings on his website. We're the ones who pointed out Nisey was delayed on May 6th, and they testified that they weren't a couple times. <laughs> so, but you know, the SEC report said it didn't matter, so I guess it didn't matter. But if your clients are experienced... It sure matters to everybody I know that trades. <laughs> uh, that's, you know, the name of the game is getting, getting the data faster. And they're requiring everybody who connects to them to have a thousand foot cable. No matter if they're 10 feet away or 50 feet away, because they all would fight over who was closer. So a thousand foot cable, it takes the speed of light one microsecond to go down thousand foot cable. So if somebody had a 500 foot cable, they would get one half of one millionth of a second faster. But latency doesn't matter, does it? <laughs> Only those financial institutions that use the much more expensive direct data link to the New York or other stock exchanges received the price information without the delay that could run up to 36 seconds. This is the NASDAQ exchange. Let's see the exhaust from the generators. And then the louvers are the air intake. So they've got three in place and looks like they have a slot for another one. So it's being constructed right now. Right, right. You see security, they'll have gates around the whole thing. 
Um, the generators are in the back. Um, and then this is another financial service firm. So no windows? Nope. Well, we can go through until they yell at us. This is their cooling systems right back here. You can see the generator exhausts in the back. And then you've got security gates. I don't want to, don't want to get these guys freaked out when they see a camera. And is there a reason that they're so close to the NASDAQ? No. They, they were in first, NASDAQ came in later. It is possible for hedge funds and banks to make money from all this volatility that we've got in here. It's, let me stop. Suppose somebody bought here and sold here, they just made a fortune. And they, they could retire on that. Um, Accenture, when it's down at, at cents, a few cents, when it, normally it's up at $42. Uh, I don't know who was doing that. <laughs> it would be nice to know. Maybe not a who, but... Or a what, indeed, yes. Yeah, if you had GE, oh, that'd be really interesting because the bid would be higher than the ads. Yeah, you see that happening here also. Oh, yeah, yeah right. Because they got okay. behind five seconds at like. ish. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. So what, is it, what do I see there, then? You're seeing one exchange is um, their, their bid price is higher than the other's offer prices. So you could buy it on the lower one and sell it on a higher one immediately and capture that profit. You don't want that to happen. You don't want it to be the case that the S&P is 1,000 points here and 1,020 points there. It's the same index. It should just be 1,000. Okay. What do you mean? I don't um, get it. So let's say I can buy the S&P here for 10% down on the day, but I can sort of sell it here at the exact same moment for 8% down on the day. I've made 2% with zero risk. If you have the exact same instrument priced differently in two places, that's free money. This opportunity actually existed, so people could, and they were, buying one and selling the other. So that's making money of the malfunctioning of the system? Yes, yes, it's arbitrage. Guys, once again, 75 even off, we are now, guys, 70 even off! Guys, this is probably the craziest I've seen down here ever. Even though it was a, a five minute flash crash, uh, it took five months for us to do the, the full investigation. The first is we had to organize. Uh, so we, we developed uh, and deployed uh, a multi-divisional uh, cross-functional team, a big team consisting of people basically from every division at the SEC. Uh, we also coordinated with the CFTC because this was a joint investigation uh, and they had a multidisciplinary team on their side as well. We had to basically reconstruct and understand what happened, what's the order that events happened in, um, and, and hopefully from that, we'd be able to determine why it happened. While the SEC was assembling a multidisciplinary team, Eric Hunsader continued his own research into the market delays. So what are we looking at here? I wanted to show how an order that comes into an exchange, how that price gets transmitted to all the other exchanges. So I p built this model and represent each exchange by one of these boxes. And the prices in each one of these exchanges shows how that exchange sees the bids and offers on all the other exchanges at any given moment. This is just for one stock. There's a lot of information that occurs in the marketplace. In fact, if you were to take the first second of trading, for all equities, options, futures in the United States, and you printed it on a, on a sheet of paper so each line was a trade or a quote. The first second of data would be a stack of paper about six feet high. One second? Yeah, one, one second would be about six feet high. It just boggles the mind. Like on that day, it was, uh, we had 7.6 billion data points. You know, a billion is a big number. So we take uh, data from all the exchanges, we save it, archive it, so that we can replay any day exactly as it occurred whenever we want. It would look to us like nobody was finding what was going on. I said, you know what, we are in a unique position to actually probably figure this out because we can play this, you know, we can just throw everything at it and just see what's unusual. 
And so that was the thing that sucked us in, really. Five months after the crash, the SEC report was published, identifying the cause of the flash crash as an uncommonly large order from an investment fund for the immediate selling of 75,000 e-mini contracts with a total value of $4.1 billion. Long before this report was published, it had leaked out that the source was the Waddell and Reed Investment Fund, based in Kansas City. So how far are we now from Wall Street? <laughs> we are uh, a thousand miles and we are culturally a million miles <laughs> from Wall Street. <laughs> Bill Black, a financial regulator back in the 1990s, now works as a professor of economics and law at the University of Missouri in Kansas City. Kansas City became important as a matter of finance because it became important as a matter of agriculture and as a matter of foodstuffs, especially meat. Uh, it was the place where you came from Texas in all those Western movies with your cattle uh, because the railroad was here and because the mighty M Missouri River was here and that's what made commerce so easy. Railroads had all this right of way and nice straight lines where you could lay the very sophisticated cable that allows you to transmit enormous amounts of information very quickly and very cheaply and very reliably. The question remains whether it was Waddell and Reed that, by using these cables to place its major selling order, caused the US stock markets to plummet. Are we at ground zero? Is this the place that triggered the flash crash? Well, the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States and many other people say, yes, this is where it all happened and that it was triggered by some trades, roughly $4 billion, by Waddell and Reed in a particular index. One of the things that I think people find hard to believe is how can any order move a market? A lot of the trading that goes on is uh, market neutral. I'm trading with you, you're trading with me, back and forth, back and forth. Tremendous amount of volume, but neither of us hold more than a small amount at any given time. I sell a little, I buy a little. I sell a little, I buy a little. I sell a little, I buy a little. And then someone comes along and they say, I sell a little, I sell a little, I sell a little, I sell a little. So wait, so that, that's, that completely changes the dynamic. Where's the, where's the buy part? The behavior of all of the market participants changes because of this very, very large trade. Waddell and Reed says, it wasn't us. And, and what can Waddell and Reed do, right? The more they talk about it, all they do is create publicity. And so they haven't followed that strategy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good evening. Hello. 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 My name is Josh Cheryl. I'm the security guard Waddell and Reed. Yeah. Right. Waddell's very, they don't like to talk much. But internally, you know, as humans are, some of them who are much closer to it are like, I, we can't take this anymore. <laughs> and uh, so they had seen the analysis that we had done and they, they said, would you like to look at our data? And I was like, yeah, send it over. I, I didn't really believe it was gonna come over like that. And then sure enough, it did. And then I lined them up and saw how they was executed. That was the shock for me. Because then I could, you know, I could cut through all the, the talk and just see the data, because the data will always tell you what happened. If you just look at the data, there is always room for multiple interpretations. This is not a flash crash issue. This is, you take any data set anywhere, uh, and you can have five people, and you'll have seven different opinions. This definitely resulted from, uh, from that large trade and the way that that large trade was placed. You can't see that. Um, by looking at just the information that, that I think other folks have looked at. Wrote some software that took all the trades in that period of time, and then I plotted it out to see where it traded. And I looked, and I was like... <sighs> so you see the red dots here? Yeah. That's the what Waddell and Reed... These are where Waddell and Reed traded yeah. here. So see, all the blue dots are where they did not. You don't even see them on that one. 
They're not even there. Is that just not there? Uh, there's one little dot here, and there's one here, and one here. Again, on, only when the market's going up. They only sell when the market goes up. They don't follow it or chase it down. So this algorithm, actually, is very sophisticated. It's extremely sophisticated. I mean, it would never sell at the bid price, for example. It would only sell when somebody was willing to pay that price by it. it just a couple here. Here, they're selling it on the way up, and then they, it stops here. Nothing. Uh, in this case, what we were seeing is that uh, the patterns were such that things were happening at the second and the one minute level. So we were able to take a lot of the quotes that were happening at, uh, within a millisecond and aggregate them so the data that you actually see in the report tends to be chunked up into one minute blocks. Uh, so you can look at it at the millisecond level, uh, but the, the noise that you get in that millisecond time frame doesn't tell you much. This is on a 100 millisecond basis. Because if you, if, you if you go out to a second, for example, then this will be averaged over the whole second, so it'll dilute it about 10 to 1. And if you looked at it in a minute, well, forget it, you would never see this, so it just wouldn't show up. But does that mean to you that the SEC report is nonsense in that sense? Well, here's, the, here, or, or here's, here's what they missed, okay? And this is, this, is when we, this is when it came out. This is when we kind of had an epiphany. It says that the algorithm sold to buyers, and some of those buyers were, uh, and I don't want to get myself in trouble with a whole group of people, so let's just say buyers. One, of the bu one group of buyers would accumulate up to about 3,000 contracts, and when they got that, that limit, then they would turn around and they would sell it, sell that position. And uh, what the report doesn't mention is when they sold it, they didn't sell it like the Waddell and Reed algorithm did, which would wait. They sold it as fast and as furious as possible. This boom, down, this is instantaneous. This is like in 50 to 100 milliseconds. They will sold about 125 to 150 million worth of these contracts. You have in here and you have in here, and then, and then um, here and here and here, and then boom. <laughs> and so my question is, if you're gonna name Waddell and Reed, or, or not name them, but name them, yeah. Why aren't you gonna tell Cock about this? I mean, to me, that is, those are, those are very disruptive. In fact, they're so disruptive, there's the, that is what caused it. So this thing started, that's exactly when the market delays happened, and they just snowballed from there. So it's one firm? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. They would know. <laughs> you well, know who, I, would, who would know? The SEC. They would know because There's, for them the data are... are, are they I mean, have, they have, okay, so all I get is time, price, a sequence number, um, and size. They get that, plus they get who did it. <laughs> uh, there are some very strict disclosure rules about um, what can be disclosed and what cannot be disclosed. Uh, and we are subject to all of those disclosure rules, both at the SEC and the CFTC. So you are not allowed to mention the names uh, so the, so the, the, flash the level of detail that we were able to go into was um, the level of detail we were we were uh, legally allowed to go into or they want to protect somebody I don't know I mean I've done all I can do yeah. we took that first step the first step is that okay let's commit a week or two to this let's just you know get into this it was the, being able to commit that time you learn just enough that, oh, God, you know, it's just so close. We got to we got to look at this. And then it just it really was has been like that all the way. I still see the light at the end of the tunnel. But, you know, you almost regret that you started. Research. I'm, well, I'm thinking it's a train coming at me. <laughs> Six years ago, there were many trains a day going south from Canada, completely full of lumber, you know, to California to build to build all the houses that now can't be sold. And now you don't see any lumber going that way. Coal going north to to Vancouver and then to China.
we like to think, because sort of in our, in our lifetimes, this digital universe has been running faster and faster and faster. Every time you buy a computer, it goes twice as fast. But, but, but in the digital universe, there really is no time. The time, time as we know it just, just does not exist in that universe. The computer is not operating on time. It, it just operates on sequence. Something happens, and the next thing happens, and the next thing happens. You ask for the next instruction, execute that instruction, go to the next one. And now we impose, it's sort of like circuit breakers. We, when we build our microprocessors, we say, okay, and you can't do anything until the clock says it's you know, a nanosecond later and you can do the next step. But the, com the computers actually don't need that at all. They, they could, be, could be totally asynchronous and just, you know, so we've sort of imposed our clock on their system. And what is the implication of that? Well, the implication is that, that, that this other world exists now that's not, not tied to our form of time at all. What we had found is when markets move fast, a lot of market participants pull back. And while that sounds like a sort of a simple thing, it's, that's pretty much it. When market participants, pull, they pull back when markets move fast. So how do you solve that? Well, how about saying when markets move fast, we're going to stop the market from trading to give participants a time to come back in. Um, first, we spoke with all the exchanges, and we met with a bunch of different market participants. And very quickly, we put in what's now been known as the, the circuit breakers, which for um, certain sets of stocks and for funds, uh, we pause the market for, uh, for five minutes if the price moves more than 10% in five minutes. Um, but the SEC's circuit breakers, though, these five minutes is like an eon and um, a long time. And... You know, they, it sets, it's set up that people could actually game them and cause delays in certain stocks by just simply forcing the price to go high enough. It would be, they would do so only if they found that there was a way of capitalizing on that. If you're the one that causes it and you know, anytime you know what's going to happen before somebody else does, I mean, that's just opportunity. And so they'll, be, they'll end up being magnets. So when you get like, if it's 10%, breaker and you're at 9%, and you're most likely going to see that 1% close a lot cl sooner than it would otherwise. We operate on this time scale where, you know, where five minutes is pretty fast. You could go out for a cup of coffee and come back and find that you lost a billion dollars. That's, that's, that would ruin, you know, ruin your day. And, and uh, yet for these computers, operating in microseconds, it makes, it makes no difference. So I think it's the circuit breakers is a case of sort of in, imposing our time scale on the computing time scale. Could it happen again? Um, the same mechanism that caused it on May 6th is still there. In fact, we see it actually occurring more often where there's um, a at least weekly, there's a pretty strong move in the E-mini, a symbol very similar to the first event. We just don't see them back to back, coupled with a lot of bad news. And we can't, we really can't predict because we don't know what, we don't know, for instance, how the algorithms have changed now. Now, now that, you know, everyone have, may have rewritten their codes to take advantage of the next time this happens. So the next time it happens, it will be different. There must be a control room somewhere overseeing everything that's happening on the financial market. Somebody. No. I don't believe there's any Wizard of Oz behind the curtain, no. There is no air traffic control for the market. Uh, and there is, there is no one person or one group that in real time sits and watches and says, wait, 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 wait that, that, that order over there, hold on, let this order go through first. It's so complicated. Just the volume of data alone is just it's so overwhelming that, and, and the problem is, is that it keeps growing at this huge, this uh, alarming rate. 
the technology that would be required and the skill level that would be required to monitor markets across exchanges in multiple places at super high frequencies and know how to deal with it. The technology and know-how is typically not found in governments because it costs a lot and taxpayers probably don't want their money spent that way. So you won't be, you won't be able to find people who would be willing to do that work for the... the for free, effectively. Not so much. I don't think so. The crash I expected, but not the recovery. It was the recovery that was a surprising thing. How did this thing suddenly go back to a more or less stable state? It is a little scary that, that, that we've given, given these machines so much power over our lives. On the other hand, you can take the other view that machine management of these systems may work a lot better. I don't, I don't I mean, that's the optimistic view. Look, humans are great because we invent things like computer trading strategies and, and uh, autopilots, but we're not so good at executing a thing over and over, which is why we have machines build our cars once we design them. It's why we have computers fly our planes once we design them uh, and uh, design that algorithm and so on. It's just the same thing applied to markets. Uh, maybe they've watched the Terminator movies too many times, I'm not sure, but uh, as soon as anything sort of slightly odd happens in the markets, it's immediately, let's blame the quants, let's blame the computers. Computers, they do what you tell them. So if you understand what's been told to them, you understand the strategy. So who knows what's inside the black boxes? Some, you hope somebody knows, but we don't even know. It's quite, it's entirely possible, and I'm sure that there are companies doing it that are allowing those algorithms just to evolve on their own. Um, just letting the black box try different things with small amounts of money. And if it works, reinforce those rules. It's, that's, that's been done. We know that's been done. So then you actually have rules where nobody knows what the rules are. Because the algorithms create new rules for themselves. Yeah, you let them evolve the same way nature evolves organisms. You say that, well, every one out of a thousand times you change something and see if it works better. And it's amazing how quickly you can you can evolve algorithms that work better. If you are an investor, meaning that you wake up one morning and you say, I would really like to buy a stock that I've been tracking and I really understand that very, very well, uh, then you can buy that stock. Um, owning the stock market is uh, historically, from the data I've looked at and studied, not been a particularly clever idea for a really long time. The last time I traded was, uh, I bought Apple in 2001. I'm not afraid, because all my money is in, uh, in cash, <laughs> earning no interest. Well, I don't have a dollar in the stock market, but it interests me, just as a, you know, I mean, so I'm sort of happy when it goes down, and I'm, it irritates me when it goes up. Why are these other people making, you know, making money by not, doing any work. Stocks in the U.S. just in the last 10 years have had two distinct declines of north of 50%. So to make 5% in a year, you're risking half your money. That to me is an awful trade. I don't make it. 